According to one national economist, the number of bank failures that would deemed to be an appropriate number is any number greater than zero. There had never been a year that did not have a bank failure until 2005. And then the second year without a bank failure was 2006. Do we remember what happened in 2007? Hey folks, and welcome back to The Mortgage Farmer. In this video today, we're going to talk a little bit about some economic indicators that have just come out. We're gonna talk about what that meant in the past, what it might mean today, and where it has us headed in the remainder of 2024. The Fed met the end of January. They did not raise interest rates and they came out immediately after their summit and the wording that they posted in that um, announcement immediately after their meeting led everyone to believe that we were ready to start seeing some rate reductions, some much needed rate reductions, I might add. But we're gonna take a look at what they've just said in the last couple of days and what that means to us moving forward. Come on with me as we talk about what's going to happen to us in the immediate future and the remainder of 2024. Let's talk about it. At the end of the Fed Open Market Committee meeting at the end of January, we looked for some signs from the Federal Reserve Board as to what we could see in the future. They typically will, they'll have a press conference and they'll announce, you know, they'll just kind of tell us what they're thinking. In other words, they'll actually read between the lines for us. In that meeting, all indications were, while they did not expect a rate reduction at the next Fed meeting in early March, the signs were there that we were ready to see rate reductions at some of the um, uh, late spring, early summer meetings possibly. So the mortgage markets and everyone got ready for that. And then second week of February comes and we get economic news from December and January that indicated that while inflation continues to fall, it's not falling fast enough according to the Fed. We went from a growth rate of 3.4% gross domestic product GDP of 3.4% down to 3.1%. So it's trending in the right direction, but it's not going fast enough for the Fed. When you couple that with jobs being robust, um, wages continuing to increase, the signs are there that inflation is not going away as quickly as they would like. And just like a train that slams on it bra its brakes and comes to a screeching halt, basically the Fed here earlier this week said, hold up, maybe there's not going to be any rate reductions after all. Now, I don't really believe that that's the case. I, I, can't, I, I can't speak for them into why they said what they did. Yes, inflation remains higher than they would like it to be. And frankly, for the average consumer, it's even worse than that because while inflation continues to trickle down, the two segments that are excluded from the inflation calculations, food and housing, the two things that the average consumer really can't control, they really can't stop eating and stop needing somewhere to live, those things went up nine-tenths of a percent. So the actual money that you and I have in our pockets to spend on things after we feed ourselves and put a roof over our head is even less than it was before. And yet the answer is let's continue to raise rates. Well, the chair of the Senate Banking Committee has come out more than once in the end of January and early February and started beating their own drum it's time to lower rates. The average consumer is being adversely impacted by the Federal Reserve artificially holding rates 
higher. That's definitely something that we want to look at. That's something that we need to pay attention to. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Let's hit here on the next topic. I want to talk about something that a gentleman named Oliver Rust from the economic data collection entity Truflation had to say. According to Oliver Rust, and he's the head of product at independent data provider Truflation, the milder drop in inflation, as I've mentioned, from 3.4 down to 3.1, so it's a drop, but it was much milder than expected, was surprising to the Fed. Rust also highlighted that both food and housing continued to, their numbers continued to increase, and core inflation jumped in January compared to December. Now, core inflation strips out housing and food. <laughs> and as I've said in previous videos, I'm unsure why we're stripping out the two biggest pieces of the pie for the average consumer, but nonetheless, that's what they're doing. The underwhelming figures that we saw in the reduction in inflation seems to be further reinforcement for the Fed to continue kind of their hawkish belief on leaving interest rates high or even raising them. Now, I still don't think they're going to raise them, but it certainly is giving them the cover that they need to not lower them. They can, they can now say there's simply no need for an interest rate cut because inflation remains elevated and the U.S. economy does not need stimulating. See, th that's the Fed's view on this over and over again. They look at themselves as this grand arbiter of our economic health. And instead of just letting it take care of itself, they feel like they continually need to be stimulating or depressing the economy instead of just allow the economy to do its thing with very small tweaks. Now, they can argue, and one could argue, that their comments about no need for rate cuts is true. But that's based upon the health of the economy. How about for once we look at the health of the consumers that make up the economy? It's almost like the, the Fed has decided that watching a non-living, non-organic economic indices is more important than looking at the difficulty of the consumers that they can see right there in front of them. Interest rate increases and cuts are tools that the Fed uses to manipulate economic growth, whether it be to push it up or pull it down. I've said that over and over and over again, that they use rate increases and rate cuts as a tool to manipulate the economy instead of just letting the economy do its thing. Again, I've said over and over again, I get it. You can't just leave it alone. There needs to be tweaks in there, but we don't need to go way over here if you're driving a car, then way back over here the other way. You're going back and forth. Just small corrections uh, to the path that the economy is traveling on. I get it that job growth and wage growth are, are up there, and those are things that are causing inflation to remain higher than they like. But what about the actual impact on consumers? Easiest example that I can come up with, sure, the GDP is down 3.1 from 3.4. But again, as I mentioned before, that excludes food and housing. And those are both growing faster than that number. It, you're hurting the consumer by doing that. Now, there's other symptoms that we had better look at before it's too late. But before I jump into those symptoms, I'm going to put up here on the screen for you to see a couple of things Notice the Senate Banking Committee Chair, the head of the NAR, National Association of Realtors, 
the National Association of Home Builders, the Mortgage Bankers Association, all are saying enough is enough. It's time to stop raising rates. It's time to stop leaving rates alone. It's time for rate cuts to come into play because the pendulum swings and you can't just stop the pendulum right here because it's going to continue swinging the other way. You have to anticipate that swing or you're going to go too far in the other direction. What are some of those things that I mentioned a minute ago that we've got other clues before I came into talking about the, you know, those institutions and those individuals that feel like it's time for rate cuts? Well, two come to mind, and both of those I have spoken on in previous videos. The first one, if you go back to the beginning of this video, my little intro snippet was a video that I posted from May of 2023 talking about the banking sector and what was going on in the banking sector. You saw those intro snippets and it talked about bank defaults. 2005, no defaults. 2006, no defaults. However, that had never happened before. There had never been a year with no bank defaults until 2005, 2006. And we know what happened immediately thereafter. In seven, we started it, eight, nine, 10. The, the train left the tracks and gained momentum. And then we trudged along. And then 2021, no bank failures. 2022, no bank failures. 2023, five bank failures. We're back at it again. I think we need to watch that pendulum. We've got these banks that are failing, and that's a clue. That's not the absolute but it's a clue that we need to pay attention to. One of the problems for banks, and granted, some of these banks failed because of lack of um, oversight and lack of good leadership, and I get that. But in the Fed's determination to suppress economic growth, basically the way the economy grows is by borrowing power, and large entities, large institutions will borrow money in opportune times to stimulate growth of wh whatever you know thing it is that they are creating well with interest rates high basically the demand for lending is at an all-time low banks are not lending any money however they must continue to pay higher rates of return on their deposit accounts or they lose those deposit accounts altogether. So you've got this push-pull going on where lending rates are high, but no, you know, so if they could lend the money out, they'd be in great shape. But they're not because nobody's borrowing, but yet they're still paying those higher deposit rates. So you've got low loan demand, you've got high deposit rates, and that's bleeding these banks. Another issue, and again, I posted this in a video less than a month ago where we were talking about the issues that we had with commercial real estate. Let me put, so the uh, picture you see on the screen is of a gentleman called Xander Snyder, and he is the um, commercial real estate economist for First American. And he has predicted that we may see defaults approaching $250 billion in commercial real estate. One of the reasons for that is commercial real estate is heavily dependent on cash flow. In other words, what is your monthly obligation on that piece of commercial property in contrast with what are your returns on that property? If your uh, monthly cost to maintain that property is uh, $25,000 per month, you need for your returns, the rents that you're charging, to be some function much greater than that, but certainly at least equal to that $25,000 a month, or you're underwater. Commercial real estate valuations are tied so heavily to the rents earned that as rents go down, or more importantly, the cost of borrowing goes up, it throws them underwater. And he is predicting as much as a 20% default ratio on commercial real estate coming up in the future. So 
if you're paying attention at home, we've got the Fed that has wanted to raise rates. We've got the Fed out there stumping to not lower rates. We've got the chair of the Senate Banking Committee, the, the uh, head of the National Association of Realtors, the head of the National Association of Home Builders, and the head of the Mortgage Bankers Association, all saying it's time to lower interest rates. The implication is it is time to stop looking at economic indicators and start looking at the consumers that we're actually here to look after before it's too late. And then we see bank failures that are beginning to uh, tick back up again, partly from mismanagement, but another piece of that is because they're having to pay so much on the deposit rates, but um, loan demand has gone through the floor. There's virtually no loan demand, so they're not being able to loan money out. Then you've got the commercial real estate side of this, and I did a video on that, and we talked about work from home and all those things. You can go back and watch that video if you would like to, where it played a part in that. But if the commercial real estate sector begins to implode, we're already at, um, at pretty, uh, in the most recent history, two, three, four, five, six years, we're already at an all-time low in that time period for new mortgage loan applications. The residential real estate market is feeling the brunt of it because of those higher interest rates. We've got all these things going along. And what I've said all along is that if we don't get some forward thinkers paying attention to what's going on. They keep saying we have, uh, we've stuck the landing here and we feel like we're gonna have a soft landing. I don't believe that's necessarily going to be the case if they don't start paying attention to what we see out there in the economy, what we see out there from just your everyday consumer. I apologize that I got kind of on my high horse there. I. Uh, I don't like to do that. I got a little long-winded. I apologize for that. I hope that you value this information. Please hit that like button. Please hit that subscribe button. We grow this channel by the traffic on these videos. We appreciate your time. We look forward to visiting with you again. Once again, I hope you don't take me too seriously. I don't take myself that seriously, but the information that I'm sharing with you here is important. And even if it doesn't directly impact you, it's indirectly impacting you in ways that you may not even realize. One of the ways you do realize food is more expensive. Housing is more expensive. Credit card debt is more expensive because the rates that you're paying are all higher. All of those things will factor in. It's time for the Fed to leave us alone. It's time for the Fed to allow rates to come back down. Expensive because the rates that you're paying are all higher. All of those things will factor in. It's time for the Fed to leave us alone. It's time for the Fed to allow rates to come back down so that we can enjoy a prosperous 2024. Thanks again for coming and visiting. We'll see you next time right here on The Mortgage Farmer.